Excuse me. But uh, thank you for being here. First Christian Church Boone at 3622 U.S. Highway 421 Villas. Right? <laughs> Villas, North Carolina. For some reason, I just want to, it reads differently to me on there. Maybe it's my Yankee heritage. <laughs> but we were talking about the passion of Christ last week. Um, we're going to do part two this week. Now I'm going to give you a quick overview. Uh, last week, we found out there was these three different women on three different occasions that anointed Jesus with expensive perfume, which the disciples and several got upset about. But, of course, Jesus set them all straight. But they didn't realize that the significance of the Mosaic prophecy that they were fulfilling of anointing Jesus as the true king of Israel. They were just doing it because he was their Messiah, and they were doing it to honor him. Then Jesus went to Jerusalem, where he, um, Judas had, had uh, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Which led to Jesus being captured and being put on a mock trial where Pilate sat Jesus and Barabbas in front of everybody to let them choose which one he was going to set free. Which leads us to right to where we are now. Before we go on to that, what is the passion of Christ? Now some of you might think, oh, it's a movie by Mel Gibson. And you'd be right. But the term passion is a Latin word that comes from path, which means to endure or to suffer. Thus, the term passion of Christ has been taken on its technical or semi-technical um, version of that as the moment of Jesus is praying in the garden to his death on the cross. Now, scriptures highlight this passion and this suffering that he went through very well. You can see it in all four of the scriptures in Matthew, it's in, verse, it's in chapters 23 through 24, in Mark is 14 through 15, Luke is 22 through 23, and in John is 18 through 19. Now, obviously, they use a lot of, they, each book had two chapters on this suffering, so it's very important to know what he went through and why he went through these things. Now, the film, The Passion of the Christ, has no doubt was very uh, accurate in the portrayal of what he went through. If you've not seen it, it is a very powerful scene in there that will just break your heart when you see what our Lord really went through. And now there is no doubt that the crucifixion is the apex of human history and they make the theme of the apostles' teachings. Now Paul makes it a proclamation in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, which says, when I come to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom, for I did not think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamations were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with the powerful demonstration by the Spirit, so that your faith might not be based on men's wisdom, but on God's power. It is through the passion of Christ that we are made right with God. When Jesus and Barabbas were standing in front of the angry crowd and, and they, they were shouting at him, Jesus not once, not once did he say anything to help defend himself or save his life. Which brings me to my next question. Did Jesus know he was going to die and be crucified? Well, yeah, he did. The Father told him this. He knew this. This was had he knew he had to die and be crucified in order to that we may live. He had to die so that we could live. Jesus spoke of being lifted up to his disciples, which was an illusion of the crucifixion where they lift the cross up and the person up. When Jesus talked to his disciples, he explained that he was going to be going away. Where in John 8, 21, he says, I am going away. You will look for me 
and you will not you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot go. You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own. But just as the Father taught me, I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases him. Jesus prayed and asked his Father if he could even get out of this when he was in the garden. He said, now my soul is trembling, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Knowing all of this was going to happen to him. He still went. He did it. He had to. It is important to understand that Christ's suffering, his passion, it was very, very real. It is not as though he simply appeared to suffer. He actually suffered and died. When Jesus prayed to the Heavenly Father, save me from this hour, he was genuinely in anguish over what he was about to go through. When he was beaten, mocked, crown of thorns was smashed onto his head and he was nailed to that cross and he was hung there and he struggled to breathe his experience was genuine suffering and pain and that pain and suffering he was paying the price for our sins for each and every one of us all the things we've done took it all Right there at the cross. He endured all that to save those who would trust and believe in him. Isaiah 53, 4 through 12, foretold the passion of Christ and revealed its meaning. And here's what it says. Surely he has borne our, bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Remember, he didn't say a word. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that for his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his, genera his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made him his grave with the wicked, and which a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, Yet it was the will of God to crush him. He was put, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of the soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear 
their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered in the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. In modern usage, the word passion is often associated with love or a strong emotion. But Jesus didn't endure suffering because of a strong emotion. That would just flame up and time to time and possibly pass away. People today can have fits of passion and do rash things that they often regret later. But that is not the passion of Christ. Jesus came to the earth to, for one purpose, of laying down his life for us, and he never wavered from it. This brings me to the next question. Who was really responsible for Christ's death? Who really killed him? The answer is a lot more difficult than one might think. In fact, there are many facets to this simple question. We all know that the chief priests had conspired to have Jesus killed. Here in Matthew 26, 3 through 4, uh, points the fact out that they had a scheme to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. The Jewish leaders demanded that Pilate put Jesus to death. When Pilate asked them, well, what should I do with this Jesus? What did they yell? Crucify him! A man that has done nothing wrong. Crucify him? The Jewish leaders demanded Pilate to put Jesus to death. Even when Pilate looked at him and said, why? What crime has this man committed? They didn't care. I didn't care what crime he did. I don't know what he did, but he, he should be punished for it anyway. You ever heard people like that? I don't know what you did. You need to be killed in jail. You had to do something wrong. No way an innocent person would ever be in prison on death row. But yet they find out they are. And yet many are definitely guilty. If you ever go to jail, everybody's innocent. At least that's what they tell me. They just yelled crucify him because they didn't care what his charges were. They didn't care what he did. Oh yeah, he was healing people. He was, you know, teaching love. He was uh, making blind men see. He was forgiving people of their sins on the Sabbath. Really? Oh my gosh, this is horrible. They knew it wasn't right what they were doing. <coughs> Pilate didn't want a revolt or a riot on his hands, and he saw that he was getting nowhere with these people. So he walked over and he, he grabbed his a bowl of water and he starts washing his hands and says, Hey, blood's on you. I, I'm innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. Like that could really clear him of his part in this fiasco, a farce of a trial. They knew that what they were doing was wrong. They even yelled, his blood is on us and our children. And guess what? It was. It has been. The Jewish leaders couldn't continue to allow Jesus to work signs and wonders that, because it was threatening their ways of life, their position in the uh, religious society that they were ever so dominating. It was a very political thing that was going on. Then the high priest spoke up, you not, you know nothing at all. Now, like Satan, he will soon twist some of God's words around to benefit himself. Where he says, you do not realize that it is better for you that one die for the people than that the whole nation perish. What was he really saying here? You see, the Sadducees were far more worried about Jesus' political impact than they were about what he was, anything else. In their recent history, Jewish unrest was met with the full might of the Roman military 
strength that would just smack them down, tear them down, kill them. In a sense, these men were correct to worry that Rome's, Rome's anger would result in a total annihilation of their culture. Although they did ignore the fact that Jesus is not talking on political power as we saw Barabbas doing. They still played to the risk of him being a rebel to Rome in order to have him killed. Now his triumph and entry into Jerusalem at Passover was another moment that really freaked the, the priests out. Because when they came out, when he was coming, he was riding a donkey. He was, they were putting these palm leaves in front of him and uh, yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. These were all prophesied. Way back in Isaiah. The priests who see this, oh my gosh, he's already got followers. Look at this. He's got followers. He's, you're fulfilling the, the prophecies. He's trying to do all this stuff. And all this stuff just proves their fears are prepared. They can see things were getting much, much worse. Now we know that the Romans were the ones who actually crucified Jesus. Now, crucifixion um, was a Roman method of killing people, executing them. Um, they did not invent it, no, no. But they definitely perfected it and used it a lot. You see, when they would crucify these people and hang them along this roadway, people would be riding in or walking by and see them. It would bestow fear upon them to ever do anything against Rome or to rebel against them. They didn't care about the Jewish people, understand. They had conquered them. They just thought that, you know, they knew that they were superior than the Romans or than the Jewish people. So when they took Jesus away and they beat him and they, the, the guards kind of went overboard and went kind of crazy. In Matthew 27, it tells us they stripped him and put scarlet robes on him and then twisted thorn uh, together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and then they knelt before him, mocking him, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit on him. They took the staff and then they struck him across the head and beat him with it. Then they took his robe off and put his original clothes back on him and took him out to be crucified. To make things worse, he made him carry some cross. And when he got tired and weak from this beating that he went through and all the suffering he's gone through so far and fell to his knees and the cross came down upon him back, they spit at him, kicked him, and yelled at him, pick up your cross. He was too weak. And along comes a man named Simon. And the Roman soldier looked at him and said, you carry his cross. And he went out there and he picked up the cross for the Lord and carried it in. They went all the way to Golgotha, which is called the, the place of the skulls. And there, they may try to make Jesus drink a whole wine with gall in it, which is a vinegary and, and bitter herbs that they put into it. But he refused to drink that. And when he had been crucified, they divided up his clothing and they cast lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him then. And above his head, they placed up his charges, Jesus, King of the Jews. There were also two rebels that went with him, one on each side of him. As people would walk by, they would yell and scream at him, saying, Who, you, who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Save yourself! Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. <coughs> in the same way, the chief priests who came by, and they would say, He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. They sat there and mocked him and ridiculed him. And so did the, the two rebels on each side of him. 
And you even see the people that were there, they were, they were just guilty because they were out there saying crucify him and when they, they released Barabbas. Peter confirmed this in Acts 2, in Acts 2, when he told the men of Israel, you, with his help, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now, in fact, the murder of Jesus was a conspiracy involving Rome, Herod, Jew, the Jewish leaders, the people of Israel, and these were all extreme, diverse groups that had never been together before on anything and ever since. But that day, they all got together at that one time to plot and carry out the unthinkable, the murder of the Son of God. I have goosebumps thinking about that. This was the greatest act of divine judgment, justice ever carried out, done by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and for the highest purpose of all, to save you, to save me, and to save all of us. In the movie The Passion of Christ, the director Mel Gibson was the one right here in the picture that his hands were filled as the one nailing the nail into the Christ's hands. Now he did this because he, in his interview he says it reminds him that it was our sins that nailed Jesus to the cross. Think about that. We're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of sending him to the cross. Now, I'm not going to get into the pain that he went up on the cross and all that stuff and get into gory detail because we know that it was horrible. But on the cross, he begged not for his life, but for other people. He said, for Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Bible says that he carried out, cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Pardon me. What do you mean? Was he suddenly overcome with, with uh, the feeling of doubt? Was he wondering if the, his mission was a mistake? Or was he filled with despair and that perhaps his work was a failure? He didn't get to finish it. And it was all in vain. After all, they did say the crowd did turn on him after he was up there. Pardon me one moment. If you think about it, the reality of his words points us into something far different than that. It points us to the fact that the cross, on the cross, Jesus took all our sins without any exception, and they were all placed on him. A person that never felt sin, never felt that feeling of emptiness, of being alone from the Father, suddenly has taken upon every sin of the world all at once, and the Father cannot be there because of the sin that the Son was going through. He couldn't sit there and watch his Son go through what he knew he had to do. He was the one without sin, and suddenly he felt the sins of the world. And as he died, all our sins were placed upon him, and he became the final and complete sacrifice for all sins. On the cross, he even said, I thirst. Knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be filled, Jesus said, I thirst. In his anguish, Jesus remained clear-headed, he was calm and aware of the prophecies of Psalms 69-21. And they still need to be fulfilled. But thirsting, even more importantly, is also a spiritual matter. And for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. Remember they gave me sour wine. Everything that happened from what he did when he was captured, even from 
his whole life was followed by the scripture through the scriptures. Everything that he did, the way he acted, even on the cross, the things he said were still being fulfilled. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman when she was talking to her, do you remember her? Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You know what Jesus said after that? The next thing he said, it is finished. What did he finish? That day we saw 25 Messianic prophecies being fulfilled. Witnesses to the inspiration of God's word. At the age of 12, he said, I must be about my father's business. And now that the word was committed, that he was committed to his whole life, it was finally finished. He was only minutes away from the conclusion, including the ultimate sacrifice for his work in the flesh. He was the atoning sacrifice. His beaten body, his blood shed on the cross, was paying for our sins. And by the way, Satan's fate was also finished. It was through Jesus' death that he might destroy him with who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Satan remains to be cast out into the bottomless pit, but his time is coming. The Day of Atonement, or the Great Tribulation, explains how God will shut the doors on Satan and open the door for humanity's reconciliation with God forever. And we talked about that in the beginning of the month. Finally, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He freely gave himself into the hands of the executioners, was now committing himself and his spirit into the hands of his father. In life, he had always submitted to his father's will, and now in death was no different. The forsaken feeling that he experienced shortly before on that cross suddenly is gone, no longer. He knew God would answer the expectation so that he gasped his last breath. Jesus uttered those last words, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He died. Words of complete This is exactly as it was predetermined in the scriptures. If you don't know this, don't just come to church, read the Bible. Read the Old Testament. All of the things that happened to Jesus were predestined to have any scriptures in the Old Testament. Jesus' death on the cross secured the salvation of countless millions and provides the way God could forgive sins without compromising his holiness and perfect righteousness. Christ's death was God's perfect plan for the eternal redemption of his own. Far from being a victory for Satan, as some have suggested, or an unnecessary tragedy, it was the most gracious act of God's goodness and mercy. The ultimate expression of the Father's love for sinners. God put Jesus to death for our sins so that we could live in sinless righteousness before him. A righteousness only possible because of the cross. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we who have come to Christ in faith are guilty of his bloodshed and for him being on the cross. He died to pay the penalty for you, for me. But God showed love, his love for us in this 
that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And remember, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light. Least his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it, and it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Jesus' passion and suffering was not due to a passion like strong emotion, but to have a subtle purpose. With Jesus' resurrection three days later, Jesus conquered death. So next week, guess what we're going to talk about? What does it mean that Jesus conquered death? So you want to come back for that. God bless each and every one of you, and thank you for being here. This time we're going to do our invitation.